Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the National Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering five conversations from Season 3, Episode 36, our review of the July 7 Intercept Pharmaceuticals press release announcing the newly compiled data for opetocolic acid, or OCA, in the treatment of Nash fibrosis. This update includes a reanalysis of efficacy data and a much larger patient pool for analysis of safety data, including almost 1,000 patients who've been taking OCA for four years. It also announces Intercept's intention to file a revised new drug application later this year. The first three conversations in this series focus on basic liver science presentations and concepts. This one touches on issues that the group hasn't covered fully yet. Stephen asks how important it would be to demonstrate a dual endpoint against both fibrosis and NASH resolution. Jorn and Roger each assert that this is an unlikely outcome given how low the percentage of patients simply meeting the NASH resolution endpoint was. The group also explores the paritis issue in greater detail, with the key point being more that we need to understand how it was controlled in the trial than how high the numbers were. Finally, Stephen and Roger comment separately that Intercept should be commended for recommitting to OCA and expanding the trial in the way that it has. With this new press release comes the realistic possibility that the fatty liver community might find ourselves with not one, but two approved medicines by the end of 2023. This would be a remarkable step forward that would create market interest, drive funding for drug development and provider education, and generally create a new, much brighter environment for NAFL diagnosis, treatment, and management. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. Stephen Harrison. On July the 7th, 2022, Intercept pressed that they announced positive data in fibrosis due to NASH from a new analysis of its phase three regenerate study of a beta colic acid. And there were four top line bullet points that Intercept wanted to make. And I'm just going to read them, and then we'll talk about specifically some of the data. Number one, the 25 milligram dose of beta colic acid met the agreed primary endpoint of improvement in liver fibrosis without worsening of NASH at 18 months. And the p-value was highly significant. It was less than 0. 0.0001. For those of you that aren't counting, that's three zeros and a one. And that was consistent with the original regenerate analysis. Point two, the 25 milligram dose of beta colic acid demonstrated double the response rate in reduction of liver fibrosis without worsening of NASH versus placebo. Number three, this data set includes larger and more robust safety database of 2,477 patients with nearly 1,000 on study drug for four years. Number four, intercept to resubmit a new drug application. So they're going to refile an NDA in liver fibrosis due to NASH. A pre-submission meeting with the FDA is scheduled later this month. So there you have it. That's their main bullet points. Now, just to dive into this a little bit, and then I want to, maybe we'll um, we'll take this section by section. I did have one thought just to follow up on yours that I want to bounce off of him or, or, or everybody. What about the combination of NASH resolution and fibrosis improvement? You know, how important is that for this drug to show that you know obviously it's a it's a tougher endpoint to hit but it's not commented on here yarn schottenberg that's a good point and i think that wasn't shown uh, also for the negative effects on the nash resolution overall i think the main message is this is a drug that affects fibrosis in this study and i would be uh, not expecting anything beyond that louise campbell i think for me it begs to ask about nash and how the patient's diet altered or didn't alter because if you're going to eat the same thing you're potentially going to continue the nash spectrum and depending on somebody's genetics so that's the way i understand it and maybe that's a different question they shouldn't both be in the same outcomes because this is a drug that affects fibrosis therefore it ticked that box is it a drug that or looking at placebo or looking at sub-analyzing somebody's diet to see how that affected what was going on in the NASH, I think may well give me more information on that. When you were asking, Sean, about what you would want to see more of, I want to know many how many patients were counseled to stay on the study with pyritis. What were they given to reduce their pyritis? How intensive is the support to keep people on a study with pyritis? Because that is really vital when it comes to delivery of this drug in the real world, because 
because I've counselled people to stay on studies for hepatitis C when we were doing interferon or bisaprovir, telaprovir. It, it can be hard work. It is a lot of input, but these people genuinely want to be there. So the amount of data that we get about how it keep, get people through the study is really important. And we very, very rarely see that delivered in any study, apart from the way it was designed, how the pathway was and what the visit schedule was. We don't get the additional muscle around, and I suppose the fat on the tissue around the skeleton of the study. That to me, for any pathway design in any drug is really, really important, but you don't see it. And in these drugs, it's going to be vital to know the breakdown and the intensity that was used. So I had two thoughts. Stephen, given how little NASH improvement they had without worsening the fibrosis, what, 6%, 6.5%, do I remember correctly? I just don't think there could have been an awful lot of NASH improvement, right? I mean, that's, that's one patient out of 17. If, in fact, every patient that had an improvement in their NAS score with no worsening of fibrosis had an improvement of fibrosis, that would only be a quarter of the patients that had an improvement of fibrosis. So uh, that that six and a half number was a big flashing thing that said to me, good for them for saying we're only going for an indication for fibrosis because the, the, the NAS number just didn't seem to me to help them very much. Didn't hurt them, which is fine, but it didn't seem to help them. Well, that's the other thing. We don't have a breakdown of the NAS here either. Except that one reported number, right? Six and a half versus whatever it was. No, that's placebo. just NAS. That's just NASH. Okay, that's right. The other thing is they didn't report the gestalt diagnosis of NASH resolution. That was the histopathologic required criteria of ballooning zero, inflammation zero or one. But definitely a good point. Good point. I mean, you know, you when you look at combining the two, you wouldn't expect it to be very high just because the overall NASH resolution numbers are, you know, around 6% or so, like you mentioned. Stephen, and more, more broadly, the, the flavor I got, we're not ready to sum up yet, but I'll do a semi-sum up on this one point. The, the flavor I got from the press release and what they chose to analyze and what they chose not to analyze was the most conservative commercial approach you could have taken, which is okay, right? Remembering that we don't know what was in that CRL letter. It's never been revealed publicly. Uh, what they seem to have done is made some decisions or assessments about what in the CRL level letter gave them problems and shared data targeted at minimizing or resolving those issues and not providing anything else they didn't have to. So if the presumption two years ago was that the efficacy numbers were okay, but it was therapeutic index or risk-benefit trade-off that was the challenge, then what they needed to do really was bring down the sense of risk. And these data are presented, I think, in a way that's designed to do that. How effectively it does that, different conversation, but that's what it's presented to do. I think we have to give intercept accolades here in the sense that they didn't give up. They persevered. They continued to drive forward. And they added three different adjudication committees, right? There's a separate renal, a separate cardiovascular, a separate hepatic, really trying to get into the weeds of what's happening here. And I think time will allow for a more robust, detailed introspection of what those results show. But at top line, I think it's positive. I would want nothing more than for this drug to become FDA approved to treat NASH. It's it's a great first start, you know. It opens up opportunities for others to be advanced quite further along in the pipeline. I mean, you know, as I said at the top of the hour, there's a real sense that there's a challenge in getting drugs approved for this indication because of the endpoint that the FDA currently has. And if we're able to get over that hurdle, even one time, the initial time, that would invigorate the field. And drugs that show significant promise would then potentially get the funding they need to continue in the pipeline of drug development. And first of all, I'm thrilled that they're going to submit a new drug application, and, and I'm hopeful that, that it will be met positively. I'm also hopeful that soon we'll have more detailed analysis of not only efficacy, but of, of what these events are that have had to be adjudicated. And then I think, you know, we'll see what happens with the rest of the field. But I, I, I have to look at the data that came out on July 7th as a very, very positive implication for the field. I'm hopeful that they'll get a positive positive readout from the FDA, and we'll see where it goes. But all told, uh, I give it 
you know, I give it two thumbs up. Please don't construe my comment as not agreeing with everything you just said. I do. All right. How they managed to present the data in the press release is simply tactical. But I agree with you. Look, they didn't fold up their tents. They didn't go home. They broadened what they did. They People talk about throwing good money in after bad. Well, they threw good money in believing that it wasn't after bad. Yeah. And, you know, I remembered a comment that Louise made about Pruritus. So you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, pruritus is nothing to, to walk away from. It's critically important. Patients don't tend to stay on things that cause pruritus. Pruritus in its severe form can be really psychologically damaging to patients. But remember, the way pruritus was defined in the study, it kind of is not the way we define it in clinical practice. In other words, Jorn and I don't typically see patients and say, you know, do you have itching? Unless they're a PBC patient or a PSC patient walking in the door and we're trying to make the diagnosis of an isolated elevated alkaline phosphatase, I'll say, do you have a lot of fatigue? Do you have itching? Because those are the one and two common symptoms related to PBC. But when I see a patient with elevated liver chemistry tests and fatty liver, I don't ask, you have itching? Are you itching? Because inevitably, you know, they start itching. I mean, because you ask the question. I'm just scratching my head now, right? Yeah, everybody's itching now on the show. So that's what you had to do in the trial is you actually had to ask them about itching, pruritus. And so whether that led to an increased reporting of pruritus, I can't tell you for certain that it did. But just like we all started scratching, I mean, it's there's something to that for sure. Now, I think that's where the drug discontinuation is, is a little bit more true. Although if I recall from the trial, there was a certain point at which you had to discontinue drug if there was a certain amount of pruritus. So again, I to me, yes, that is something to follow. Dose titration might help mitigate that in some way, but I am really more focused on the hepatic events. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Surfing Nash Tsunami to drop on Wednesday, July 20th. Please join us. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.